One thing I've talked about a lot on this channel is old Marvel cartoons and how they might be a little more complex than we often give them credit for. And within that field, I've often talked about the so-called Yostverse in particular, a grouping of a few animated projects from around a decade ago, which to some degree or another are usually understood to share a continuity. But one comment I get very often is that one of these shows, the spectacular Spider-Man, isn't canon to the world of the others, and that the Spider-Man who shows up in Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes isn't the same guy as we saw in that first show. I want to put this matter to bed. So in this video, we'll be trying to settle this issue once and for all. In the first section, I'll go over the arguments for and against this particular continuity dispute. And in the second, I'm going to talk a little about the larger ramifications of debates like these. Can truly shared continuities ever exist? And what can the recent cultural fascination with them tell us about the processes by which we read fiction and consume media? But before we get into it, I'd like to tell you about this video's sponsor. Scientology. Do you want to pay most of your money to a secretive organization and commit to a theology that holds an evil space emperor trapped our immortal spirits here on Earth by luring his extraterrestrial subjects here and then slaughtering them? If so, boy, do I have some great new- wait, hold on. Wait, what? Are you saying we didn't get the Scientology sponsorship? Ah, oh, damn it. All right, scratch that. Let's get back to Spider-Man. Are these two Spider-Mans Spider-men? Spiders-men? The same guy? Well, yes and no. But before I explain what I mean by that, let's look at the background. First, why do some people think that Earth's Mightiest Heroes Spidey and Spectacular Spider-Man are the same guy? There's a couple of major reasons. Let's start with the most obvious one. Earth's Mightiest Heroes Spider-Man was originally voiced by Josh Keaton, who played the character in Spectacular Spider-Man. Keaton recorded the audio back in 2010, but found out with the rest of us when the episode Along Came a Spider aired that the lines had been redubbed by Drake Bell, who'd go on to play the character in the following series Ultimate Spider-Man. But this was a decision made by the studio, not by the EMH creative team, presumably to promote brand cohesion. The fact that Earth's Mightiest Heroes staff hired Keaton for the role and wrote this Spider-Man with a fairly similar personality and characterization to the Peter of Spectacular is one reason some people like to imagine these two figures are one and the same. This in itself is hardly evidence though. Plenty of animated projects and video games get familiar actors to reprise previous roles, despite existing in clearly different continuities. No, for evidence, we're best to look to Twitter. Also, side note, you should follow me on Twitter, I just made an account for this channel. But self-promotion aside, this cesspool of a social media platform might actually be useful for the first time in its existence, because if we look at the feed of Christopher Yost, ex-head writer and showrunner for Earth's Mightiest Heroes, we see tweets from 2019 definitively stating that the Spider-Man in EMH was originally intended to be the same as Spectacular Spider-Man, that along came a Spider was intended to be Spectacular Spider-Man at heart. That might seem like a fairly definitive answer, but let's have a look at the arguments against a shared continuity. First, there's the fact that Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes and Spectacular Spider-Man have different official Marvel Universe designations. Avengers EMH, as well as Wolverine and the X-Men and a couple of other projects, are listed as Earth 8096, while Spectacular Spider-Man is Earth 26496. The thing is, these universe designations aren't decided by the creative teams for these shows. They tend to be given in tie-in media, like annuals, which aren't always necessarily accurate to the project themselves or the intentions of their creators. The second point against, in my opinion, holds more weight. Greg Wiseman, Spectacular Spider-Man's developer and writer, once said in an interview that the intention with the show's setting was to stay in a situation reminiscent of Marvel in 1962, where the other major heroes don't yet exist. Maybe there's a Fantastic Four or Hulk somewhere in the background, but no Avengers, no Thor, not yet at least. Now, Peter's only 17 when he first appears in Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes second season, and that's after all of the first season has taken place, which itself is seemingly a good while after these heroes got all powered up. And look, I'm not familiar enough with the intricacies of American high school to accurately guess Peter's age at the end of Spectacular Spider-Man, but many feel that these two timelines simply don't line up, and honestly that's fair enough, it is a bit of a stretch. And the final point against canonicity is the vault. The supervillain prison exists in both worlds, but in very different forms and in very different places. This would seem to fly in the face of a shared continuity. 
It is possible to come up with explanations which get around all of these points against a shared universe, of course. It just requires a little imagination. We might think, for instance, that the vault we see in Spectacular Spider-Man is sort of a test run for the final version we see built in a more remote location in Earth's Mightiest Heroes, a beta vault. Or perhaps that other vault already exists, and the one we see Spidey testing is a second overflow location. And maybe when Spectacular Spider-Man starts, the Avengers hadn't all suited up, but I'm sure there's a theoretical way to organize all of these events into a schedule which just about fits. You know, maybe he is 17 and along came a spider, but maybe it's the day before his 18th birthday or something. I think there's just enough time here to squeeze it all in. All that being said, these are fairly big imaginative leaps to take, and I do wonder if trying to shoehorn Wiseman's world into a shared universe he clearly didn't plan for does a disservice to his work on Spectacular Spider-Man. So maybe it's possible to view these two shows as straightforwardly sharing a continuity, but it's not clear that we should. But the thing is, I think there's a better solution anyway. Wiseman says it was his intention for Spectacular Spider-Man's world to be its own thing. Yost says it was his intention for Earth's Mightiest Heroes Spider-Man to be the same one we'd seen from Wiseman's show. And there's a way that both of these can be true. Because even if these worlds exist in different realities, that doesn't mean that their Peter Parker's lives were different. Think about it this way, the vast majority of Marvel's alternate universes, except for fringe cases like Marvel 1602, take place in a vaguely similar world, a world largely resembling ours. Most details are the same. There's always an America, for instance, which means that the lives of the Founding Fathers played out in the same ways, and that the colonial policies of 18th century Britain were similar. Speaking of Britain, the fact that English remains the lingua franca for the US suggests that British history played out the same way. A Celtic island was invaded by Romans, Anglo-Saxons and Normans, until they formed a colonial empire, speaking the language we all know today, etc, etc. The fact that there's always a World War II against Germany tells us that medieval European politics resembled ours, and so on. I could give more examples, but I feel like you get the point. Except for the most wacky alternate timelines, human history is like 99% identical across Marvel's multiverse. All I'm suggesting here is that the Peter who grew up to become this Spider-Man lived a near-identical life to the one we see in Spectacular Spider-Man. So off-screen, before and potentially during the events of Earth's Mightiest Heroes Season 1, the Peter we later see in Along Came a Spider was going to M-Cubed, was fighting the Green Goblin, was doing everything we see in Spectacular Spider-Man just in a near-parallel timeline. Except maybe he doesn't get locked in the vault, because the vault in this universe is a little different. And maybe one day, he and the rest of his classmates get lifted into the sky as Graviton attacks New York you get the picture. In this solution, Wiseman's world gets to stay separate, but the Spidey we see in EMH is, for all intents and purposes, the spectacular Spider-Man. So there's my suggestion. And you might be thinking that it's a bit of a cop-out, that if that's the case, it's not quite the same. It's not a true shared universe. And maybe that's true, but here's the thing. I'm not sure that any true shared universes can ever exist, not perfectly at least. Let's take a step back. What is a shared universe? At its most basic, a shared universe is the current term for a character or aspect from one work of fiction appearing in another work of fiction. When one work crosses over into another, be that a modern blockbuster team up like Avengers Endgame or Dracula showing up in House of Frankenstein. You can go even further back. Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn featured an appearance from the already established character Tom Sawyer. The thing is, no shared universe ever has a wholly consistent reality. For a recent example, look to the presence of the MetLife building in Hawkeye. It's well established that in the MCU, Avengers Tower stands where the MetLife building does in real life. But this isn't the case in Hawkeye. If we are being draconian with continuity, the only possible explanations for this are that the rebuilding we saw in Far From Home turned Avengers Tower into the real world MetLife building, which, come on, will not be the case. Or that Hawkeye doesn't take place in the MCU proper, but instead in a universe 99% identical, except where New York City has a more realistic skyline. But clearly, engaging with Hawkeye in this way is ridiculous, and not at all what any of us are doing. There's plenty more examples too, just look at the infamous Homecoming time skip. 
Examples such as these can be found in any shared universe. Sometimes they're way more obvious, like how the Universal Monsters crossover films killed off various characters only to bring them back in later films with no explanation. I mean, forget crossovers, continuity errors are as old as sequels themselves. Hell, the Bible's full of them. The thing is though, most of the time, we don't pay attention to them. Just like in that Hawkeye example, if you catch the error, the detail which objectively shows the incompatibility compatibility of the text with the rest of its so-called shared universe, you just think, hmm, okay, and then you move on. I enjoyed Hawkeye regardless. I had issues with it, but none of those issues were to do with the MetLife Tower. And this point is important. We don't get our enjoyment specifically from an imagined inhabitation of a fully cohesive and flawlessly pieced together universe, and we never have. We get it from somewhere else entirely. The compulsive rationalization we go through, where we come up with complex headcanons to explain inconsistencies in order to tightly fit two worlds into one cleanly shared universe, it's a relatively new phenomenon. No one was doing that when they walked out of the cinema after seeing Frankenstein wailing on Dracula, or whatever happens in those films, I haven't seen them. And look, I'm not saying that you're wrong if you get wound up by continuity errors, or if you really care about the difference between Earth 8096 and Earth 26496. I'm saying that there's a reason we still enjoy crossovers even when everything doesn't fit perfectly together. So okay, why do we enjoy crossovers? How and why do we take pleasure from imagining objectively inconsistent settings to be connected shared universes? Well, it's simpler than you might imagine. Let's take the first Avengers film. Imagine two worlds. One is ours, and in the other, Marvel's Phase 1 never happened, and Avengers 1 was released first. Identical in every way to our version, just without the context of those introductory films. Now, it seems inevitable to me that in this imagined world, people don't react to the film as positively as they did in ours, even comic book fans. You look on that parallel world's Rotten Tomatoes, and it's not going to be 91% fresh. Maybe it'll be 70% fresh, because the film itself is pretty great. But the reason it became a smash hit, and defined the last decade of cinema culture in the way it did, was because when people went to see it, they weren't looking at Robert Downey Jr. and the Chrises and seeing Tony Stark, Thor and Cap purely as they were written in the Avengers script, they were superimposing on top of that film their memories and interpretations of the characters from the Phase 1 solo films. They were seeing composite versions of these heroes, versions which never actually existed in any single given text. In cases such as this then, it's the audience, the viewer, who is responsible for the construct of the shared universe, and all the narrative and emotional heft it adds to crossover stories. And the viewer subconsciously constructs this illusion of continuity every time they engage with the texts in question. Of course, it's not solely the viewer who's responsible for this phenomenon. The author shapes their text in a way which facilitates and encourages this imagined linkage. But at the end of the day, this is as much a mental thing as it is a textual one. So how is any of this relevant to the first part of this video? Greg Wiseman, Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and Peter Parker. Well, I want to suggest that really, it doesn't matter which Earth label these worlds officially have, and that it might not even matter what Yost or Wiseman have said on matters of continuity since. Josh Fine has said a few times that when it comes to matters of continuity, it's ultimately up to each viewer to decide what they want to consider canon to this world. And this isn't just a cop-out answer. The point I want to make is that on a far wider scale than just Earth's Mightiest Heroes, the hermeneutic benefit of any shared universe is created by the reader. Continuity errors, official canon, aren't the things which create or destroy the increased sense of investment and connection we get from something like the Avengers. No, it's our own minds and the way our perception of one work is deepened when we mentally link it to another. So if you enjoy Spider-Man's appearances in Earth's Mightiest Heroes more, if you imagine that this vault was a prototype for the bigger one we'd see in Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and that just after the curtains fell on Spectacular Spider-Man Season 2, Iron Man's suiting up for the first time in a cave somewhere, then go for it, more power to you. But if you'd like to imagine a future for this Peter Parker, which doesn't see him team up with the disgraced Captain America against the Serpent Society, or joining the new Avengers to fight Kang, then equally, it's in your power to construct, visualize, and experience that world. 
When Roland Bart proclaimed the birth of the reader in 1967, I don't think he had Spider-Man in mind. But nevertheless, I think when it comes to matters like the dubious continuity of the Yost vs. Spider-Man, or the MetLife building in Hawkeye, or even the contradictory plotting of those early Universal monster films, we should keep in mind that the texts themselves, with their connections and inconsistencies, are only part of the shared universe phenomenon. And the other part, perhaps the more important part, is, and always has been, inside the audience. And as a result, it's your birthright as a reader to generate meaning from stories, however you interpret certain details. And that's it. Thanks everyone for watching, drop a like if you enjoyed this so it stands a chance of hitting the algorithm, and hey, maybe smash that subscribe button or drop me a follow on Twitter. I hope to see you again soon, and a special thank you to all my patrons on screen now, especially Ian Fifield.